Eagles Entertainment. Eagle Eye in the Sky is fueled by Gatorade, the official sports drink of the Philadelphia Eagles. Everything that moves, I don't care who it is. Let's go. Give me everything you got. Play fast, play hard. Let's beat these boys tonight in their house. It's party time. It's party time. Let's go. Touchdown. You are listening to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Now here's your host, Brand Duffy. That's right on the week, and we're getting you prepped for Eagles Panthers today. As the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade, continues. I'm Fran Duffy, and as always, I think we've got a great show for you here on episode number 361. At the top of today's show, we've got Chalk Talk, where I chat with my friend Ben Fennel, where we talk about our final thoughts from the film in the Eagles' loss to the Kansas City Chiefs before going a little bit deeper into Sunday's matchup against the Carolina Panthers. After Chalk Talk, we will transition to our scouting report, where we're going to focus on one of the best players on this Panthers team, and that's wide receiver DJ Moore, former first first round pick back in 2018. Before we get there, a couple of things I want to make sure we hit on. Number one, make sure you join us over on our Apple podcast page. Leave us a rating, leave us a comment. If you've got a question about the Eagles, now's the time. Jump on over there, leave the question in the comment section, and we will answer it here on an upcoming episode. Also, make sure you go subscribe to the Journey to the Draft podcast, where myself, Ben Fennel, Dane Brugler, Ross Tucker, Eric Galco, a list of, of other guests join us every single week getting you ready for next year's NFL draft. Obviously, could be a huge, huge, huge weekend for the Philadelphia Eagles, potentially three first-round picks. Best way to get ahead, make sure you jump on to the Journey to the Draft podcast and get all of your questions answered before we get to that point. Now, that said, let's get into this conversation with Ben. Excited to talk about our big takeaways from the film. Let's go into Chalk Talk. Let's get down to business. It's time for Chalk Talk. All right, let's get things rolling here as I welcome in Ben Fennell for some chalk talk. Ben, uh, let's start here with the Eagles Chiefs recap. And obviously a lot to talk about on the offensive side of the football uh, from this game. The Eagles defense just really struggled to to get stops. Uh, Obviously, both defenses really struggled uh, to get stops in this contest. But I want to start with the Eagles first round pick, Devontae Smith. What did you see from Devontae in this game? And and what what does that point to for him moving forward? Yeah, I saw a guy that can really separate when he gets man-to-man coverage. A guy that really strong in his releases at the top of routes and his route stem. Such a crafty route runner. And then some highlight plays at the catch point as well. I think he finished with seven for 122. Probably could have been eight for about 160 if he had that 40-yard touchdown. Uh, That wasn't called back. uh, Stepping out of bounds just slightly. But a guy that I think is really starting to stack some performances now and really show you why he was the Heisman Trophy winner, why he was worth a top 10 pick, and why he can be a dangerous weapon in this league uh, in a variety of ways. And I think on Sunday, you really saw the three-level aspect from him too, whether it's the tunnel screens, the slants, the stuff over the middle, uh, getting open and route running, or being a shot play guy down the field, whether at the catch point or just winning with speed. I think uh, anytime you have a three-level receiver with that level of uh, playmaking ability, that's why you take him in the top 10. He really showed you that. And bouncing off that point too, like uh, to me, when you talk about the quick game and screen game, all right. So yards after catch, we want we want a, a receiver that can be present early. We see the the guy with the guys with the vertical element, and Devonte proved that, right? I but to me, like the, those the best receivers are able to win in the intermediate area as well. Right. And that's where we saw him saw off that quick out route uh, right before halftime. Right. And he creates the five, six yards of separation. We saw uh, that crazy was, it it was a triple move, like kind of a stutter go comeback, but like you see that ability to create separation uh, in that, you know, eight to 15, eight to 18 yard window as well. And, And I love when you can see a young receiver do that at a high level. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are wondering if he was going to be a slot receiver or a guy working over the middle of the field. The way the the Eagles feature their tight ends, uh, you know, through different schemes, different coordinators, Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard, I think, really showed up on Sunday. And the fact that they're the middle of the field targets, that lets Devontae be kind of an outside threat or a guy that get the yards after catch or work the sidelines in two-minute drills, which Jalen seems like he really likes looking for Devontae in those two-minute drill scenarios. So I think it's a really interesting and diverse skill set when you kind of look at the full package of skill players. And Jalen Hurts, uh, obviously a lot of really impressive throws in this game. I thought the game plan was really sound. They did some good things to get the ball out of his hands fast. Uh, and he responded with some big-time throws. Nick Sirianni did mention in his press conference there earlier this week as well the areas that he wants to see him improve. Uh, and just kind of seeing Coach talk about, look, there are times where 
you know, you're in the pocket, the throws there, pull the trigger. We talked about that earlier uh, this week with Greg Cosell, where some of those posts in the high red zone, not even just the one where, you know, he, he threw it a little bit high for Zach Ertz and missed him. And I believe that was the opening drive, but just some others where he didn't make the throw, right? Where it's like, okay, just continue to see those plays a little bit faster and pull the trigger. But look, that, that's the story with a lot of young quarterbacks in the league. You can go back to the eighth and ninth and 10th starts for a lot of some of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, and you'll see some of those same issues. It's about now Jalen correcting some of those mistakes and continue to build on what he's done, which is, I mean, he's look, he was operating at an extremely high level against Kansas city last Sunday. You know, and I think the silver lining for Eagles fans while we're sitting here one and three is a lot of the issues have been kind of self-inflicted. And I think when you take that to the week, you realize you weren't outmatched. You weren't outplayed. It's an us thing. And anytime it's an us thing reflecting back on a game, I think you feel good because you control that. Whether it's, you know, the penalties, the slightly stepping out, whether it was Rieger two weeks ago, Devante this week. Um, just like the subtle things in the game, I think you can reflect back and say, yeah, that's an us thing. We can fix that. We can be better here. And we really haven't been completely outplayed. I know the Dallas game didn't go as well, but even the pick six to Trayvon Diggs. Devontae Smith slipped and fell. When you go back and watch that on tape, that's an us thing. We slipped and fell. You know, we created that play and they took advantage of it and credit to our opponents. But I think there's a lot of silver linings to take away through four weeks, despite the one and three record. Yeah, I think I think it's a good point. And then even, you know, capitalizing on that even more, we talk about Jalen Hurts. I mean, three touchdowns come off the board. And Shiel Kapadia made this point uh, recently over on the Birds with Friends podcast, just talking about how, uh, you know, those three touchdowns, like, yeah, those those penalties, I think you can kind of argue about, uh, you know, those, those calls could have gone either yeah, sometimes way. Sometimes they get called, sometimes they don't. Exactly that's, right. That's the nature well, of the league. Yep. No question. But then at the end of the day, you're looking at it like, all right, well, you know, Jalen's day could have been even better. Like, what are we talking about at this point in the week? If the Eagles had scored 40 plus, you know, like, I feel like yeah. the conversation is even, you know, more different, even more tilted uh, towards the positive end of this. Discussion. And, you know, you kind of opened the show with, you know, the, uh, the Eagles couldn't stop the chiefs. I don't sit here on Monday morning saying, Oh, we let up 42. We didn't give ourselves a chance. That's a team that's going to score 42. You got to score 43 and beat them. And I think that's the conversation. We lost 42 30 with three touchdowns taken off the board yeah. and a pretty good performance from our quarterback, but what could have been. And when you reflect back, you just say, if only this, if only that a play here, a play there. And that's the nature of the league. And I think every losing team kind of has those moments of if only here, if only there, if only we made that play or didn't get that penalty called or the ref blinked for a second, that's the nature of the league. You know, it can, it can change on you quick. And, you know, at the end of the day, this is an, uh, a Kansas City Chiefs team that's been in the Super Bowl each of the last two years, and this Eagles team went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them uh, for much of that football game. Let's talk a little bit about the game plan and the plan of attack here um, from the Eagles coaching staff on the offensive side of the football. I thought we saw some really good things, the use of Kenny Gainwell and the, and the motion pre-snap used in a lot of different ways from that end. Uh, the screen game was excellent. They got the ball out fast. Uh, I know, you know, that was a stat that you had pulled coming out of this contest as well for Jalen Hurts. Just as something that uh, when you look at the way that they went about this game I was impressed with the plan of attack yeah I think with the uh, offensive line you know in flux and some last minute adjustments with Lane Johnson being out a couple backups in there already in combination with Steve Spagnuolo's kind of pressure scheme I think the formula was let's not try to test the trenches too often let's get the ball out to the perimeter which a lot of those quick screens were extensions of the run game and some of them had offensive linemen blocking for those receivers. So it's a real extension of the run game. I just thought the formula was great to not only help the offensive line up front in some of the, obviously, uh, patch jobs, but the pressure scheme, expecting blitz. Jalen Hurts looked pretty good out there when he got the ball out. He was 16 to 22 for 160 and two touchdowns. Anytime he got the ball out, under two and a half seconds. So anytime he was in rhythm, in structure, that ball came out quickly, accurately, and pretty efficiently most of the day. And what do we say about QB friendly uh, QB friendly plays are typically friendly for the offensive line, typically friendly for yep. the running backs, friendly for the receivers. Uh, I thought we saw plenty of that on Sunday. And I think that that kind of spills into what we were thinking for Eagles game plan this week, because the Eagles have another tough test from an offensive standpoint, looking at this Panthers D uh, you and I watched the, this defense thoroughly uh, Phil snow, what they've done 
so far through the, you know this season, one of the leaders in the league in sacks. I think they've got, what was it, 14, 16 sacks through four games. Um, they do an outstanding job of breaking down protections and you know creating a look where, hey, we're going to send you five this way, but we're actually going to bring four the opposite way and drop a bunch of guys out uh, from the way that you're sliding and you can't change the protection post-snap. And all of a sudden, you've got two free runners at the quarterback. Brian Burns, a player you and I were both high on coming out of Florida State, He's had three sacks this year. I don't think he's been touched. I don't think he's been breathed on by an offensive lineman in any of those three sacks. And he's a good player, but the the, the sacks that he's gotten uh, have been a large part of what they're doing schematically. And so uh, the Eagles likely having to do some of those same things. We'll see exactly how they respond from a game plan standpoint here on Sunday. But we wanted to point that out this week over on Eagles game plan. Yeah, and I think it's a similar approach to the Chiefs and Steve Spagnola, where, yeah, you look at Chris Jones, and he's kind of a game wrecker. The, the Panthers have Brian Burns. He's kind of a game wrecker. But collectively, they don't have a whole lot of guys that win one-on-ones up front, you know, for either team, whether it's the Chiefs or the Panthers. So what do they do? They send a lot of exotic pressures at you, a lot of stunts, loops, twists, and they're really going to test not only your communication, but your eye discipline and Anytime you have guys working next to each other that maybe haven't with, you know, rookie Landon Dickerson and Driscoll coming in, you know, who was hurt through most of camp and they're really going to test communication. And there's even some things like Dillard and Dickerson working together last week where, you know, they saw the stunt, but they weren't working on the same level. And you know how long it takes, you know, the caliber of players like Brandon Brooks and Lane Johnson to really get comfortable with each other. It takes reps. It takes weeks and weeks and years and years to really get comfortable and just understand not only how I play, but how the people to the left and the right of me play. And the Panthers particularly are going to test the offensive line, communication, technique, everything. Yeah, It's a a big mental game for sure with what they do from a front standpoint. Uh, Looking at the other side for Eagles game plan this week, we wanted to kind of hone in on Joe Brady and that offense Eagles fans, not totally familiar, not always seeing uh, what they're doing down there in Carolina. This is the first time we're going up uh, against Matt rule and Phil snow and Joe Brady. And for people that are, you know, that follow college football, you may be aware, you know, Joe Brady was the pass game coordinator for LSU during that undefeated title run and and Joe Burrow and Jamar chase and Justin Jefferson. So uh, we really wanted to kind of hone in on some of the similarities we're seeing between those two schemes, what he did at LSU and what he does, what he's doing now in Carolina. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Sam Darnold's starting to show some flashes of Joe Burrow and reflecting on their skill sets and how Sam was evaluated coming out of USC. They really aren't that different at quarterbacks. They're fairly athletic. They have capable arms. Uh, they can see the whole field, work the full field. Um, and I think Joe Brady is finally getting back to that kind of LSU form now that he has a guy embodying, you know, a Joe Burrow and what Sam Darnold's doing. So we're seeing him create a little bit out of structure with his five rushing touchdowns this year, I believe. But a lot of the same pass concepts that Joe Burrow won the national championship with um, a lot of high low stuff, work in the middle of the field, some dagger concepts, uh, a lot of levels. And they have Terrace Marshall in there, the LSU buddy uh, of Joe Brady to kind of make it all tick as well. So Chris McCaffrey's not back there. But the pass game is really clicking. And, uh, you know, I think this Panthers uh, weapons and pass games can be dangerous. Got to get after that offensive line. If I'm looking at an area to attack, that old line of the Panthers is definitely suspect. I mean, they str- really struggled blocking Dallas this past week. Uh, it was it was tough sliding, and honestly, that that really impacted Darnold. That impacted the uh, efficiency of the of the offense in general. You mentioned Terrace Marshall there, the rookie second round pick from LSU. There were a number of times where he was wide open uh, in this past game against the Cowboys, and they were just unable to be able to get him the football. Him and Darnold just not on the same page. But that's a guy just keep an eye on. Uh, lines up a lot of times in the slot, a big slot receiver that can work vertically. Uh, that'd be a name certainly to watch here in this one. Yeah, that was a guy that was streaking free a couple times against Dallas. And uh, whether Darnold was looking the other way or maybe the pressure got to him, there were some plays. He saw Marshall a little emphatic that he wanted the ball. Anytime you see that on tape, maybe get a couple extra targets that next week. The quarterbacks are, excuse me, the receivers never usually yeah. shy about letting the quarterback know he was open in the film room. Yeah, the, the film room will, set, will certainly uh, be on fire with that standpoint. But <laughs> the guy that the high, the big target getter for this Carolina offense, DJ Moore, uh, former first round pick. We're going to talk about him here in a little bit. So I don't want to dive too deep into his skill set, but I do think it's interesting. 43 targets so far this season. The next guy on that list, 22. So nearly double the amount of targets as the next player in this passing game. DJ Moore, he is the focal point here for Sam Darnold and Joe Brady. 
Yeah, and he's having to wear a lot of hats. You know, with Christian McCaffrey out, he's kind of their slot receiver. He's the third down possession guy. He's the shot play guy on the opposite side of Robbie Anderson. And now he's taking some Christian McCaffrey rolls out of the backfield. So I think that type of skill set, you know, really has a running back style frame to him. He looks like Debo Samuel out there at 5'11", 215. So he looks the part. He's almost doing a little too much, though. So this could be the week. Maybe uh, Terrace Marshall starts to capitalize. Don't sleep on Tommy Tremble and some of those other other young guys on there, too. Yeah, uh, Marshall, Tremble, another rookie playing. Uh, Chuba Hubbard, obviously, with McCaffrey potentially out. Uh, Once again, could get his second straight start, the the rookie running back. And and we can't forget, you know, I think it's a perfect formula for him with them trading Dan Arnold uh, to the Jaguars to go get C.J. Henderson. That's one less tight end body. Terrace Marshall's been lining up number three in trips quite often, work in the middle of the field. Maybe the perfect storm for Terrace Marshall to get some more touches this week. Yeah, I'll be thinking about you anytime he gets targeted uh, in the passing game on Sunday afternoon. Let's go to their their defense real quick. We talked about them schematically. Uh, they've had a couple losses, a couple of tough losses in the secondary the last couple of weeks. They lose J.C. Horn on Thursday night football a couple of games ago. They lost Justin Burris, who uh, had been their free safety and also kind of a big nickel for them. They're kind of a... You know, they're one of those defenses that, you know, you'll say like they use a lot of positionless players, right? They like to move guys around and use a bunch of different packages, but uh, losing those two guys, that's been big. That said, a couple guys at the second level, I think are really impressive for them right now. Shaq Thompson has turned into a really good play. He's, he's impressed more this year in this defense than I think any other time I've watched them. Uh, and then Jeremy Chin in year two coming out of Southern Illinois. Uh, he is really impressive as well. Play down in the box, uh, can play in space, you know, play some big nickel for them. Um, so that's a guy that can be used in a lot of different ways. I think those are two players just reflecting on who they were coming out of college. Shaq Thompson out of Washington was essentially a safety slash running back and how he was used at Washington and Jeremy Chin, kind of the same uh, safety linebacker, but they could have had completely different usages, roles, career trajectories with other teams. And I think it's really fun to look at those ball clay types and how they might've been used elsewhere or not used elsewhere. I think Phil Snow's uh, scheme, uh, particularly once he gets into those third and medium third and longs, I mean, they're perfect for him. Yeah. Now it's just a matter if they can find a true early down role and if they're going to be a liability in a certain you know position. Jeremy Chin played a little more linebacker last year. They said they want to keep him at a little bit more of a safety role on early downs this year. Why? Because he struggled as a linebacker last year and you know occasionally had to take on blocks from guards and things that some of those uh, bigger safeties don't want to do down in the box. So, uh, but two really fun and clearly positionless players. I mentioned some of those injuries in the secondary. This was a team that early on this season, when everyone was healthy, they played a lot more man coverage. We saw a lot of cover one. We saw a decent amount of cover two man as well early on based off my notes. But then also uh, now, since you've had those injuries, you know, Rashawn Melvin's in there, AJ Boyer's in there. Uh, They go and they trade for CJ Henderson. He's got traits to play in any scheme, but it seems like they're playing a little bit more zone. Uh, Looking back to last week, we'll see if that continues here uh, in this game. With all the injuries, uh, I don't know if they've got quite the horses to be be able to play the same amount of man coverage that they were to start this season. Uh, Just something to keep an eye on here. Uh, Big stats uh, that stand out. Anyone that I know you obviously pull a lot of numbers for preparing us for uh, Eagles game plan each week, getting the talent ready. Any number or two that stands out most to you? Yeah, a couple interesting ones here. Uh, Jalen Hurts last week featuring those tight ends was 13 of 15 for 125 and a touchdown. Another one that was called back, but featuring the tight ends, second most passing yards of tight ends in the NFL. Uh, Dallas Goddard, Zach Hurts doing a lot of dirty work in there. Some other interesting ones, Fran, screen passes with the Eagles leading the NFL. It's going to be something the Panthers are keying. Now let's see the next levels of the wrinkles of the screens, more misdirections, maybe double screens, maybe even a triple screen like we've seen over the years. Fake left, fake right, screen right down the middle to a tight end or back, something like that. And another interesting aspect of their offense, which people may not realize, leading the NFL in shotgun formations. So I want to see maybe Sirianni does some self-scouting through four weeks, which is a major landmark with NFL teams now that you're have a quarter of the season in the books. Typically you do your season based on four game intervals, do some self scouting, maybe Jalen hurts under center a little bit more this week. And what does that open up? Some more play action boot, get them on the perimeter by design as well. So just a couple interesting notes there featuring the tight ends, the screen passes and the shotgun versus under center with this Eagles offense. 
Let's see what the seventeenth game. I don't know if teams will still do the four game intervals. Maybe they wait till like halftime uh, of week five, and then they'll. They, they, all nothing's right, nothing's clean like, anymore with the seventeen. <laughs> it's odd numbers, and we're dealing with fractions and. <laughs> Uh, I think that's a big one. And for more on the, the Eagles tight end usage, make sure you guys go check out my post snap read. Uh, that's where I posted uh, just my thoughts on them incorporating the tight ends over the last couple of weeks, especially we've seen both Dallas Goddard and Zach Ertz, a big part of this offense. And you talk about really hurts comfort and efficiency and how they're getting those guys open. I covered all that. You can find that article over on PhiladelphiaEagles.com and the Eagles mobile app. Also check out the all 22 review. That's where I did my full all 22 recap all the plays that Ben and I kind of saw and do, and drew up uh, the, that you could find that over on PhiladelphiaEagles.com and the Eagles YouTube page uh, real quickly, before we get into scouting report, Ben uh, one individual matchup that stands out to you most in this game. We talked about uh, their inability to protect Sam Darnold last week. And so to me, like the spotlight on some of these edge rushers looking at cam Irving at left tackle. So, you know, whether it's Derek Barnett, Josh Sweat, you know, if you want to throw Milton Williams in there, or Ryan Kerrigan in there, Jerry, Jannard Avery in there, uh, Patrick Johnson in there, wh- whoever it is, I think these are some of these matchups you want to try and win, try and do some of the same things that Dallas was able to do a week ago. They had stru- uh, trouble against the blitz. They had trouble against stunts. They had trouble against four straight four man rushes. So however it is, the Eagles have to be able to find ways to be able to get home and impact Arnold. Yeah. And as we're sitting here midweek, they obviously had some issues with protection last week. They have some young players as well that haven't been in the lineup yet. Brady Christensen, second round pick BYU, big Deontay Brown out of Alabama. So haven't seen any practice reports yet, but there's a chance maybe they, they get some young guys in there this week. So be on the lookout for a change up in their offensive line. But yep. let's go to the other side. Hassan Reddick, I think we know, coming over from uh, the Arizona Cardinals, joining Matt Rule and the former uh, Fighting Temples over there with the Carolina Panthers. But Brian Burns, I think, is just really emerging as one of the more dangerous pass rushers in this in this league when you incorporate phil uh, snow so i was gonna say phil Steele, our good buddy on journey of the draft but phil snow's pressure scheme but he can win for himself in a variety of ways and he's becoming a really really advanced pass rusher already a guy that we did a full study on at o-line masterminds over the summer that retreat that brandon brooks lane johnson big duke mannyweather hosts for offensive linemen his speed rushers his long arms his inside moves I mean, go watch his spin move against the highest paid tackle, Ryan Ramchek, I think in week two or week three. Absolutely smoked him. So whoever's that tackle for the Eagles, whether it's Driscoll, Lane Johnson, Dillard, Malata, you want to get Jason Peters from the Chicago Bears, you want to go get Todd Harriman's or uh, Runyon out there out of retirement, go get them. Brian Burns is going to smoke them all. So he's a guy off the edge, number 53. Avoid those third and long situations, Eagles, because Brian Burns is going to be coming. It's an interesting one uh, for sure. And Brian Burns, a really, really intriguing young player in this league. Uh, speaking of intriguing young players, we've got one more to cover here. We talked a little bit about DJ Moore, the star wide receiver for Carolina. We're going to cover him even more in depth right now in Scouting Report. Dim those lights. We're headed to the film room for the Scouting Report. All right, let's get into the scouting report here on DJ Moore, Ben. Uh, this is a guy who was a first-round pick coming out of the University of Maryland in 2018, a player you and I both studied uh, heavily uh, when he was coming out just a couple years ago. Crazy now that this is his, uh, what, his fifth year uh, in the NFL. But let, let's get into your thoughts first, and I'll, I'll kind of chime in with some of my notes as well. Uh, when, you do, when you studied DJ Moore, how did you view him coming from the Terps? Yeah, he was a really interesting player in college coming from the Maryland Terrapins at 5'11", 215. Ran 4-4-2, 39-and-a-half vertical, 11-inch broad. So he definitely had some explosive elements to his game and more of a smaller, diminutive, rocked-up uh, type of body. But you saw the speed. He saw the acceleration not only in the routes but yards after catch. Fran, his ability not only to make people miss and yards after catch, his yards after catch transitions. He would catch the ball and immediately get into runner mode. And they featured yep. him in screens quite often, can break tackles, had good, confident hands. And the interesting thing was being 5'11", 215, kind of that gadget presence, that slot receiver, he was an outside receiver for about 80% of his career. Mm. So he was a guy you didn't see in the slot quite often. And um, I think he kind of struggled over the middle of the field at times, struggled with some contested catches, uh, didn't have the frame, didn't have the length to really beat some longer corners uh, out there in the Big Ten. Uh, and you just yeah, had some concerns about his size, just being 5'11", 215. You thought maybe he'd just be more of a slot possession guy and a guy you had to get the ball into his hands and wouldn't be able to win down the field. But really interesting player, had tons of highlight grabs 
as well. So while I say contested, he had a bunch where he had to make some adjustments, a one-handed or, or two, not really the same type of category, but a uh, really impressive player at Maryland. He was a guy that, you know, when I, so I was starting to kind of place a little bit more importance on wide receivers and the ability to play through contact. I remember really noticing that his ability uh, to fight through contact mid route, fight through contact at the catch point. He had really strong hands. He made some great one handed grabs. Um, and then also uh, to take a quote from uh, Charles Davis used it last year on a broadcast talking after talking with Mike Tomlin. And I remember Charles had said, Hey, you know what? You guys have had a lot of success scouting wide receivers, like and and finding these guys from the college level, putting them in the NFL. This is obviously after Chase Claypool had started to blow up, and you know all the history that they've got uh, with drafting wide receivers. And he said, "What's one thing that is important for you guys that you know maybe we don't necessarily think about?" And Tomlin's response was, "We don't want guys where it's a chore to catch the football." And I remember with DJ Moore watching him at the combine and even see, you see all on film as well, but watch him at the combine go through wide receiver drills. It was just so natural, so easy. He never broke stride. He never flinched. Everything was bang, 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 bang. Uh, just such a natural hands catcher. Uh, and I think a lot of those same things we saw from him at Maryland. I mean, at Maryland, I talked about earlier how, you, you know, you put, they would put him in the backfield now uh, with Christian McCaffrey out. He caught a touchdown on a little Texas route uh, this past week against the Cowboys. Uh, they did that with him in Maryland. Like he took carries out of the backfield as a runner. Uh, you made the comparison like a Debo Samuel. He was used that way, but he's got, I think he's got a little bit more route running chops uh, as well. So he's got that ability to create some separation, play through contact. He's a, a really good finisher at the catch point. He's great after the catch, just a really good player. And I, I don't know though. He's gotten enough attention for where he kind of stacks up against some of the top receivers in the league. You know, almost forget he was the first receiver off the board in 2018, yeah. 24th overall pick. Calvin Ridley went to later. Who was your uh, number one receiver that class? Because it was an interesting year. You know, the top five receivers, more Ridley of Cortland Sutton, the top of round two, Pettis, Christian Kirk, Anthony Miller. Some of situations that maybe didn't work out into their young careers already. Yeah, it was a, a really, really talented class. And just looking through uh, at the way I had them stacked, I know that I had uh, DJ Moore and Calvin Ridley uh, all in the same tier. I had Christian Kirk up in that tier as well. I actually had it as Moore, Ridley, Kirk. And then Cortland Sutton uh, right in the, uh, let's see if it was the same tier. Actually, yeah, Cortland Sutton in that same tier. Well, that's not bad. I had, three, I had, I had DJ Shark kind of mixed up in there, but... I don't know, Fran, you know, considering how 19, 20, 21 went, I don't know if this was that talented of a receiver group, you know, considering the influx of talent we've had in the last three years and the standard and expectations. Um, but DJ Moore there at 24, you know, Calvin Ridley sitting there at 26 receivers that probably had a little bit more specific scheme usage at the next level. And probably two guys that are a little divisive as far as have they been worth the first round pick? All right. And that's, I think you kind of have those conversations about first round wide receivers. It's like, if you're not uh, that high impact certified, number one, early on, oh, well, was he worth it? I, I, just, I just, to me, like, and I still look at that position. I know there are guys that come in and, impact, and make an impact early, but I think of like Devonte Adams, right. And, and I mean, you saw that up close, you know, how many green Bay fans were ready to cut him after year two, right. I mean, he didn't really hit his stride until year three, year four. And that's where he became Devonte Adams that we see, you know, that now as one of the best in the league, I, I just feel like with that position, especially you got to give those guys a little bit of time. You're, you're going to have your crazy, like the, you know, the, the guys that have the unique physical gifts that maybe that allows them to set themselves apart early. Um, but with a lot of these guys, you just got to give them a little bit of time. Yeah. I think some were so trained to look at the top performances when really they're more the outliers and the rookie receivers that come right on the stage are the outliers. The most of them take a year or two and have some development, but we just look at the success stories and say, well, what about that? Why aren't we getting that? And I think it's more of a rare case than, uh, than the consensus. And anytime you're pointing to the outlier, you're typically going to leave yourself disappointed. Yeah. And I think too, and this is not just like a, uh, an Eagles fan standpoint. I think this is a fan of every team. Cause I see it, you know, if I post a clip of, uh, you know, I posted the clip of Landon Dickerson, right. Where he had like, where he dumped a couple of guys in pass protection against Dallas. And I had so many fans from other teams quote tweeting that saying, you know, like saying, Oh, I can't believe the dolphins didn't take him. I can't believe this team didn't take him. The Raiders didn't take him. All these guys had the chance to take them. And it's like, 
you know, Eagles fans, they say they, their response say like, oh, well, he wasn't great for the entire game. I think we get so caught up as a, as a fan, whatever fan base, whatever team you're a fan of, whatever your local fan base is, you look around at other teams and you're like, oh, well, see this highlight. Like, how come we don't have them? You got to take the full picture. You got to allow the, you get, understand that there are going to be pros in each game and cons of each game of all these young guys. And, and you're, you got, you got to live with the, the highs and lows when you play rookies. There's going to be good. There's going to be bad. It's very hard to come in and have a high level of success, uh, depending, especially you know, depending on the scheme and your, and your usage and all that. And wide receiver, especially. I just feel personally that that is such a um, dependent uh, position where there's so much that needs to go right as well for you, right? I mean, you need the the play call, you need the quarterback, you need the offensive line, uh, the protection obviously needs to hold up well, right? So, uh, so many different things, uh, you know, that you need to be able to go well. So it can be tough sometimes to kind of discern. Well, is the wide receiver, is he not performing well because of uh, his ability or is there the other extraneous factors at play as well? There's so many factors in, into it. And I think that's, that's why it's so hard to predict careers and you're not just, it's not an individual sport. This isn't golf tennis. You don't control your own destiny. You're at the mercy of, you know, your O line is your quarterback any good. You have a well-balanced offensive design, a lot of different factors that come into it. And I always have case studies in the back of my head that I'm just like, Oh, if only he had this with him or they didn't use him like this, you know, like I always think back to like Tavon Austin's of the world, right? It's felt like he was an incredibly explosive, dangerous receiver that was completely misused. And there's just like scenarios like that where it said, if only his career went this way, we'd view him as a completely different type of player, but. Um, or if he came into the league, if he came in the league learn. five years later, like if he came, right. if Austin yeah. came into the league in, uh, you know, 2019, as opposed to what was it? 2012 or 2013. Um, right. people, people, people said about Peter Wark all the time. Like, Oh, he was sure. a decade and a half ahead of his prime. Uh, I think you get those cases as well. Yeah, absolutely. You, you mentioned golf there. I've heard you make plenty of uh, excuses in the past. Of, oh, my golf game wasn't great today because of, uh, you know, this other factor is that it's not just me. It's not just me. Uh, well, I don't make the mistakes out there. You know, I, I can't control the, the winds in my face on every hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, but no, we have these discussions all the time over on the journey to the draft podcast, which is why you need to be subscribed to the journey to the draft podcast. Uh, we will be talking about all these top prospects coming through the college ranks, getting ready for next year's draft. Make sure you go subscribe wherever podcast can be found. Ben, we will talk to you later this week over on the journey to the draft podcast until then uh, we'll see you next week. Great stuff there from Ben, who you can follow on Twitter, just like I do, at Ben Fennel underscore NFL. And while you're at it, I'm at Eagles XOs. That's where I post all the podcasts I'm a part of and all of our X's and O's content that we produce here with Eagles Entertainment. You know how much I appreciate everybody that promotes this podcast on all forms of social media. That's one way to support the show, but the best way is to go on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, leave us a rating or leave us a comment. I want to give a shout out today to someone who did exactly that, Michael J., went onto our Apple podcast page and left us a five-star review with a question saying, Fran, love the Dallas recap last week and also really appreciate the All-22 review that you put together. Nick Sirianni explained why he does not use motion to help Jalen Hurts with reading the defense because defenses are getting smarter with disguise. He went on to say that instead of using pre-snap motion, Hurts can read the defense by observing where safeties and linebackers are set, if corners are over, and the communication and numbers over bunches and stacks. I would be interested in your thoughts on this. So, Michael, uh, good question, and obviously look this past week uh, against the Kansas City Chiefs. We saw the Eagles use a little bit more motion, right? I think that was a little bit of an outlier back in week three where you saw zero pre-snap motion. I don't know if that's necessarily the goal on a weekly basis, but look, there, there's going to be those conversations, right? And, I, and depending on the coach that you're talking to and their background and who they've worked with in the past, uh, you're going to hear a different kind of take on the use of pre-snap motion. I will say, Typically, especially the veteran quarterbacks, like those old school vet quarterbacks, you know, Peyton Manning famously never liked motion. Phillip Rivers in the past never liked motion. Aaron Rodgers up until uh, he paired up with Matt, Fl Matt LaFleur did not like motion, right? You go down to, you know, Drew Brees, not a big motion guy, right? It's all, uh, they want to be able to see the field, see the defense and understand well, this is how they're going to line up right now. There are pro just like everything in football and something Ben and I talk about all the time here on this show and over on journey to the draft. There are pros and cons to everything. Uh, and so if you use a lot of motion, uh, there, there are cons to that. As, as uh, Nick Sirianni has pointed out, if you choose to, not to use it, there are pros and cons to that as well, right? So the, the pros of using motion are that it can create some favorable angles at times. It can create some favorable matchups or create some miscommunication uh, at the second and third level of a defense. There are also times where 
all of a sudden you use motion and it changes the defensive look. And maybe that makes things a little bit more complicated for the quarterback or brings a defender into an area where you don't necessarily want that defender to go. Right. So uh, there are certainly pros and cons. That said, again, we saw the Eagles use Kenny Gainwell name, uh, you know, in, in particular, use that, use him in motion a little bit more often this week, create some misdirection, get the defense flowing one way and hit him back the other way. I think that you know that week three game against the Cowboys, a little bit of an outlier. Um, but yeah, there, there are definitely look, you know, there are so many coaches around the league that will say, yeah, the way we line up, there are lots of different looks for a quarterback to be able to say, this is how we're going to read this. Is, these are the keys that we can get on a defense in terms of getting them information before the snap. So uh, while motion has certainly become more in vogue around the NFL, uh, every coach is going to view that differently. So great stuff there from Michael. And thanks so much to him for that question. And I hope that answer satisfied and answered uh, your question. Now, before we wrap up the show, as always, I want to throw you some extra uh, cutting the bits off the cutting room floor here from this week's Eagles game plan. Great analysis here from Greg Cosell. John Clark, Mike Quick, Ike Reese couldn't squeeze it all into the 30-minute the program getting ready for Eagles-Panthers, but I saved all the best of the rest here for you. Here's that clip from this week's Eagles game plan shoot. And how about that game plan? Because you saw some motion pre-snap. You yep. saw the misdirection. And I guess the key is getting the ball out quick and getting it into your playmaker's hands in space. Well, especially when you're dealing with an offensive line that's in flux. A lot of different moving parts on the offensive line. It helps them and it protects your quarterback when you have a game plan like they went into the game with. Misdirection, getting the flow going one way when the ball's going the other way, and quickly getting the football out. How about the involvement with the tight ends? You're really seeing Dallas Goddard and Zach Hurts, and they had some touchdowns called back that would have added to the production. But what are you seeing from the the tight ends? Well, obviously, they're a part of the game plan. But the biggest thing is, is I thought last week Jalen was able to get to those guys on his second or third read at times. I mean, teams are going to force Jalen to stay in the pocket and try to play from the pocket. And I thought last week he stayed there. He played calm, made good, concise throws, and he knew exactly where he wanted to go with the football. Those two big targets in Goddard and Ertz are quarterback's best friend. Find those big guys and that catch radius will help you out. And how about the running back situation? Because Kenny Gainwell's getting almost as many touches as Miles Sanders. What is Kenny bringing in addition to what Miles Sanders brings? This team sees the value in Kenny Gainwell, his ability to catch the ball out of the backfield. He's a nightmare when you've got him one-on-one against a linebacker and the guys that are going to try and cover him. He's explosive downhill runner. He brings a lot to the party as a young guy. All right, well, you're going to be facing a temple flavor Temple South down there in Carolina. There's like six Temple Owls on the Carolina Panthers roster. You got Phil Snow, the defensive coordinator. That's who the birds are going to be going against. So the Eagles offensive line, which actually had a very good game in pass protection against the Chiefs a week ago, this is a mental game more than anything because you have quickness off the edge in Reddick and Burns, and you've got power inside in Derek Brown. So you must be in a position where you account for people. You cannot let free rushers at Jalen Hurts. Now, we know Jalen Hurts is the kind of quarterback that can avoid free rushers. We've seen him do it through four games, but that's really not the way you want to structure your pass protection. Get downhill on some of these plays. If our defensive line is going to do their job up front and get penetration and take up linemen, then our linebackers have to flow fast, get downhill, deliver the blow, and then get off the blocks to make the tackles. Those four or five, six-yard runs need to be turned into two, three-yard gains, and that gives you a better chance on third down to be able to get off the field. Sounds like he's ready to do it. He's ready to get in there. (laughs) Listen, within every defense, within every scheme, there's a run fit for everybody. The A gap, the B gap every gap there's a run fit and when guys stick their nose into those run fits they're able to slow down the run they're able to stop the run and teams are not as productive on first and second down when you're not productive on first and second down then everything else will flow for your defense but if you allow big plays in the early downs it makes it so easy for teams to go nine and ten on third down A lot of defenses now play zone coverage. They particularly like to play with two split safeties. That's very much in vogue in the NFL, and we know that the Eagles do an awful lot of that. Now, one thing Brady has done with Sam Darnold is he's really defined reads and throws for him. Darnold is playing the best football of his career because Darnold now is able to play with a sense of timing and rhythm. 
the ball comes out. He doesn't sit in the pocket and get stuck in the pocket. We often saw him do that with the Jets. The Eagles, obviously with the loss of Brandon Graham, uh, they're trying to get pressure. That's a big loss. You saw Dallas when they blitzed Sam Darnold. He had an interception. He had the sacks. What can the Eagles do to mix it up against Sam Darnold? I think they have to do more of the same. And when you look at the Panthers' offensive line, there are certainly some weak spots. The left tackle, that's a weak spot. The right guard, that's a weak spot. And the Eagles have to take advantage of that, be it blitzing or just getting pressure in those areas with the twist stunts and the things that they like to do. I think it's fairly easy to break down the protection of the Carolina Panthers' offense and get to Sam Darnold and create lots of problems for him to throw the football. All right, maybe we could see Fletcher Cox get his first sack this year. Obviously, he's getting double teamed a lot. You have the loss of Brandon Graham. You've got Javon Hargrave getting a lot of good pressure. What can Fletcher do to get those stats going? Because he is doing some other things on the field. I think the biggest thing Fletch can do is not get frustrated. He's a veteran. He's gone through these little periods in the past. And the best thing that he's done is continue to fight, continue to get out there on the practice field, work every day, be a leader by example, and the plays will come. You continue to play hard. They will fall your way. Right now, Javon Hargrave has been a beneficiary of a lot of the attention that Fletcher has gotten. But eventually, that attention is going to be shifted towards Javon Hargrave. And then that's when Fletcher is going to have his opportunities. So just stay ready continue to work hard, but Fletcher knows these things. He's a six-time pro bowler, and so he just needs to continue to do what he's done in the past, and the plays will happen for him. When you know that there are chinks in the armor, you have to take your best players and have them exploit that. And if you're moving Fletcher around, if you're moving Hargrave around to make sure that they exploit those weaknesses on that Panthers front, then you can make hay. A great stuff from all those guys. And again, you can check out Eagles game plan over on PhiladelphiaEagles.com, the Eagles mobile app, all the Eagles social channels on Friday. Uh, that usually goes up around midday. Uh, or if you live here in Philadelphia, you can go check it out Sunday morning, 10 a.m. over on NBC 10. Uh, great stuff from all those guys. Great stuff so once again for Ben Fennel this week. Thanks to him. And thanks to all of you out there for your continued support of this show and all the rest of our podcasts here with Eagles Entertainment. That being said, I think that'll do it. Another show in the books here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast fueled by Gatorade. For everybody here at the Novacare Complex, I am Fran Duffy. We will talk to you next week.